Bird Island is one of the islands in the Seychelles, a very, very small island that you can walk around in about an hour. And it's a place with such happy memories um, that I take it wherever I go. And it's a place where ultimately my ashes will be spread, so I will go back to a place that I hold so dearly. This is a short film about a remarkable young woman's encounter with a hospice. Linda Hopkin was living in the Seychelles where she had a successful career as a financial controller of a seafood company. August 2009, I took a trip to go sailing around Australia. And um, this is the last photograph of myself taken pre-cancer so to speak and about a week after this I collapsed on board the boat. Linda's collapse was initially thought to be appendicitis so she had surgery but on her return to the UK she collapsed again. This time the diagnosis was cancer. I'm 39 years old and I was diagnosed with terminal cancer about uh, 18 months ago. I've only started coming to the hospice in the last six months. Early in 2010, with no likelihood of a cure, Linda was referred to Thames Hospice Care in Windsor and the prospect filled her with dread. What did hospice mean to you when you first heard that word? Most certainly a place where you go to die. And I remember being it being suggested by my Macmillan support that I was at a stage where I needed some extra support and being filled with absolute dread at the thought of coming here. What was the dread? About losing my independence, about being in a place where I, what I perceive might be similar to a hospital. Uh, where people might not necessarily be friendly to me, the food might not be nice, I wouldn't feel comfortable, I wouldn't feel as I did at home. 21st of November 2011. Who would believe it's been almost two years since the whole journey began? In that time I've lost a lot. Most of my liver... Linda's some of my first bowel, day at Thames Hospice Care energy, was the opposite memory, of what she'd expected. Instead of death, she found life. Yeah that had fish eggs on it. Because lots of and a way of coming to terms with the situation she now found herself in. But I've gained so much more. A new set of amazing friends and carers, a different outlook on what are the important things in life. Here, all the worries are taken away from you, both from the perspective of if anything happens medically, like my temperature should suddenly shoot up. I had a fever on Friday night. And I felt okay because I knew I was in safe hands. It didn't matter that I was showing physical symptoms. I knew I didn't have to worry because they would take care of me. But there's just this feel of being absolutely 100% relaxed and not stressed. I have found a peace being here. Stuffed pepper, right? my favorite. Yeah. There you go. You haven't got cabbage. I don't it's know. certainly enabled me to come to terms with my illness in a way I never thought possible. And simple things like sitting out in the garden and just listening to the birds, listening to the school children in the, in the fields um, next door, things that I would never have taken the time to listen to before or think about, have actually just made me sit and contemplate life and actually think how lucky I in fact am. The first day I was here, somebody knocked on my door at, at five o'clock and said, well, would you like your feet massaged? And I'd already felt that I was grateful just to be allowed a, a bed in the hospice, let alone then to be pampered as well. So you were made to feel very, very much cared for through therapeutic treatments, such as massage. There are counselling services that are offered. It's not some place where I've suddenly come for the first time in the last few weeks of my life. It's been a place where I have gradually come, got to know the people so well here that they are like family members. So that fear of those last few days or few weeks is no longer. 
today I've come down to the day unit um, for a foot massage and they've got amazing treatment rooms um, so it's a place where I can just sit back fully relax and must transport myself to a, a different environment and be pampered for a little bit. When you start attending a hospice it's not just you that's affected. Family and friends will want to know what's going on. A few of them have been in touch yeah, with you to try and understand more from you. Because everyone thought the hospice meant she was going to die. Um, and I knew she wasn't because we'd already had that conversation. But everybody else I spoke to had that, oh, she's gone to a hospice or oh, she's taking morphine. So you get that a lot. So what did you think a hospice was? Death camp. Oh, what? Death oh. camp. <laughs> I've not heard of it as crap. <laughs> I did. I thought a place where people go and die. No, um, but I was expecting good things of Thames Hospice Care because Linda had already said, oh, it's incredible. It's amazing. It's, you know, there's beautiful gardens and that's where I sit and I enjoy sitting there. What frightens me the most isn't dying. It's that period of time when... I'm no longer able to perform basic functions for myself. But through the reassurance of the nurses here, I know that I won't be in any, any pain. And I know that if I ask it, they will be here to hold my hand every step of the way. And I've built up, over the time that I have been here, I've been able to build up such a relationship with them, and that's so important. Oh, must just pop round, say hello. Oh, and, uh... There is always noise around me, there are always people with a smile on their face that want to know you, are full of such care and compassion. So important to have that level of deep relaxation helps the body to work as well as it can to cope with what's going on. When you're up tight and tense, the muscles are tight and they impede the flow of the blood that takes all the nutrients where they need to go and the drugs and restricts the nerve action and also reduces your immune system. And the worst thing of all about carrying the tension is it uses up your very precious energy levels. And they're always in very short supply with the people we see. And Linda got so much better being there. That was the most incredible thing. It was having been on quite a downward spiral for some time. It was the first real, you felt as though I got, you got better for a bit, mm. you know, really made such a, a, an effect on her mental state that it made an effect on her body, you know, as well, on her physical state. You can't isolate the physical from the mental, and they're both of, of so much importance in the journey that you're going through. And I think that's the side that a lot of the, the medical profession don't actually see, because they're not necessarily in the front line of it. It's either the the nurses in the hospital on the chemotherapy ward who see to some extent the front line because they're there administering the chemotherapy but you're sort of in and out within a few hours but it's only the front line people at the hospice who are dealing with the aftermath and your day-to-day -day care who really get the chance to see the emotional side and the mental side of the dilemmas that you face when you're going through chemotherapy. So I still thought it was going to be like a cute, quaint little hospital, I think was what was in my head. Oh, oh yes, if you, if you want to pop in on Saturday, that would be, that would be lovely. And it, it so didn't right, feel yes. like that, you know, so you go to the lovely private room with your you. nice uh, en suite. Right, um, Thank you for calling. You've got, you had the garden room and I was there as well, but only the best oh, for Linda. Um, and, um, I was just blown away. I thought it's not like a hospital at all. And the food, you know, that is a part of care too. When Linda is at the hospice, I know that the whole of Linda is cared for and loved. I was Late in 2011, Linda chose to stop receiving further treatment. She knew that this might mean shortening her life, but the monthly cycle of chemotherapy was impinging too much on her quality of life. In you, I have somebody that is completely realistic. When you make choices and that, like when this, we maintain our relationship, it's important that yeah. those closest to you understand. And, you know, we all hope that I might be here in six Absolutely. months' time, but, but one thing, particularly with Claire, that I appreciate 
I appreciated so much was Claire's support when I decided to stop treatment. Don't, have, you, have you regretted it at all? Don't think you have. have Not you? at all. No, I don't think so. Breathed a huge. I know. Sigh I did. of relief. And you're, you're, you're actually the only person that has thought beyond her own selfishness in terms of just want to keep Linda going as long as possible. I think everybody else has, has in some way has just said, oh, but you've got to keep going, you've been through so much, you can't give up now. Yeah. I don't think through all of this I could have asked don't do ever to have had a better friend. Ever. Sorry, Claire. <laughs> Oh. when people can say is there anything else that can be done and there is another treatment that we could go with that, that may extend your life by a couple more months but it comes to the point where you reach a stage in your life or, or within that you've had enough of putting your body physically through the continual turmoil and you just want to be left alone. It wasn't just friends and family who questioned Linda's decision to stop treatment. It was also the health professionals who had been doing so much to prolong her life. At the beginning of this year, I had a session with my oncologist and put my opinion to him. And he was completely taken aback because he, he said that I had never given the, him the impression until now that I might possibly want to stop treatment, that most people, particularly at such a young age, would bite his hand off for the chance of an extra six months of life. And I felt terrible, I felt I had let him down, and I almost felt that I should carry on because I, it was something that was important to him and I didn't want to let the medical profession down who had fought so hard to keep me going. So that's great. So the liver has improved, which fits with your liver function, the tumour yeah. markers, everything. Yeah. But they're saying that the lungs have gone... So um, yes, so I hadn't complained of, my, of the side effects of chemotherapy. That's not because there weren't any. That's just because I got on <coughs> and dealt with them and didn't want to make a fuss. It had taken nearly a year for Linda to make up her mind to stop treatment. The fatigue had finally become too much for her. The decision was not an easy one. And what's happened to your weight? Well, I'm torn between, on the one hand, just wanting to get on with it. Sure. And saying, well, I'm here now. I let's, understand. Understand. Get but, on but, and it, have but, it, it, but, but if it is treatment related, yeah. I don't want you feeling. Even but worse no, I'm saying, I, what I wouldn't want to do now is go home. And, and literally, the treatment to kill me because it's just, it's too much, do you see what I mean? At first, it was suggested that Linda take a break from treatment and resume it when she felt stronger. If your quality of life is going to be bad and we gave you the treatment this week, we would regret it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that could be up to another four weeks. So I think it's yeah. better to get you stronger first, okay. get you a little bit on the recovery phase, yeah. and then say, OK, we're doing well otherwise on all the blood markers, etc. Yeah. Let's move forward. Okay. So, so even an uptick next week, I would be happy to go ahead, because yeah. the treatment takes about seven days to kick in anyway. Yes. So you'll have another week of recovery after the treatment. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, and if you're not feeling better next week, then we have to rethink this sort of yeah. whole strategy again, uh, whether we're giving you too much drug. But obviously, I'd prefer you to be on the road to recovery. Yeah. Okay, I had no partner, I had no children, so an extra six months to me wasn't necessarily going to mean an extended quality of life for me. So it becomes this whole issue, what is quality of life? And I think an oncologist may well have a different perception of that to somebody such as a, a, wor a Macmillan worker or somebody here at the hospice. And it's taken a lot for me to actually sit down and actually say, no, now enough is enough. Because there has always been that feeling of not wanting to disappoint anybody, particularly somebody that has fought to try and save my life. I have been quite lucky that a lot of focus and attention has been given to me by the medical profession. And I do feel grateful for that, and I have to keep reminding myself of that. 
Yes, in hindsight, when I see my oncologist now, he says, well, maybe we could have done this operation first or that operation first, but we will never know. All I know is that he has done his utmost to help extend my life and give me further quality of life. And I'm grateful for him for that. And at the end of the day, we will never know, but it, it doesn't matter. It, to me, it really, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, beautiful. I know, so yeah. nice. I'm, getting I'm, I'm, I'm letting it cool off a little bit, and then I'm going to Thank you, Lynn. I remember first coming here and being told, you know, there is no expectation that I can be cured, but they can certainly make my life a better place in the time that I do have left. I'm an accountant by, by trade um, and I spent my life rushing around thinking that the most important things was to, to save money for my future, not spending enough time with my friends. So I spent a lot of my life running away because until I had cancer I always looked that my glass was half empty. I was always rushing around thinking about the material things in life and it's only through this whole journey and through the support that this place has given me and the people I've met have I, has it actually changed my perspective on life. One of the hardest things about accepting that an illness is terminal is the thought that you will no longer be here. The fear of no longer being here from an ego perspective seems to have disappeared because I felt that I've been on a journey, that journey's coming to an end and I've achieved actually so much and become a better person for it that this is just the next stage. So it doesn't feel, doesn't feel like a loss of ego at all. It just feels like the next stage of a journey. Like all independent hospices, Thames Hospice Care relies mainly on public donations to help people like Linda and others who are in need of hospice care.